Good evening. I am Dr. Anil Parikh, Director of Medical Affairs and Clinical Research at IPCA Labs. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome our esteemed faculties, both uh, national and international, and all the doctors across India who have logged in for today's uh, uh, CME, and it is going to be an academic fest. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure to discuss. Uh, uh, today's discussion will be centered around clotheridone appraisal and reappraisal. And for that, we have a very, very imminent uh, faculties, both national and international. And uh, we have some new things on clotheridone, new studies, as well as new perspectives, which keeps coming of this old drug. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Khair, Chairman, Division of Nephrology and Transplant Medicine at Medanta. He has been a past president of Indian Society of Nephrology and member Kedigo Transplant Group and Regional Research Coordinator for International Society of Nephrology, South Asia region. And he has established the clinical department of nephrology starting from Sherry Kashmir Institute and then SGPGI and then at Apollo and Medanta. And then he has been awarded fellowship of National Academy of Medical Science, Indian India and Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh and Indian Society of Nephrology. So a great contribution from him and many academic uh, original research papers, book chapters. So welcome, uh, Dr. Vijay Khair. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, so we have a very, very uh, important perspective from the nephrology side from him. Then we have Dr. C.K. Ponde, who is a consultant cardiologist at PD Hinduja National Hospital. And... Uh, uh, he is a very, is a very, very uh, uh, imminent speaker and very, uh, very well sought out. He's always sought for his perspectives, and uh, we are very fortunate that whenever we request him, he's always willing for uh, sparing his time for CME activities. And uh, he has the privilege to be selected as a referee for articles in cardiology for the for the JAPI Journal of Association of Physicians of India, which is very widely circulated. He is fellow in inter interventional cardiology from Royal International uh, Ambassadorial Scholar and also fellow in electrophysiology from Brisbane, Australia. For uh, He worked in from 96 to 97 and he has been very sought after and delivered various lectures. So I welcome Dr. C.K. Ponde to our panel. And then uh, we have another uh, very senior cardiologist, Dr. Samir Dani, who is... Uh, Director Cardiology Service and Chief International Cardiology at Apollo CVHF Heart Institute, Ahmedabad, and Director Department of Cardiology Apollo Hospital, Gandhinagar. He is Honorary Cardiologist to His Excellency Governor of Gujarat, President Cardiological Society of India, Gujarat State Chapter, Founder CVHF, and honored with Glory of Gujarat Award by the Governor of His Excellency of Gujarat and honored with Dr. He's a BC Rai awardee as well and more than 175 publications. So I welcome Dr. Samir Dani to this uh, August con uh, conference. Next. Next, we have Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan, who is director and professor of neurology in Institute of Neurology, Madras Medical College. And he has been a treasurer of Indian Academy of Neurology and active member of the and international advisor to American Academy of Neurology and founder member of Advocacy Wing in Indian Academy of Neurology. And he's editor of various prestigious uh, journals like the Neurology Southeast Asia edition, Paul Rogers textbook of neurology and Biller textbook of practical neurology. And this has contributed more than 100 publications and book chapters. And he's uh, received best scientist award from Tamil Nadu Council of Science and Technology. Then next, uh, uh, I would, uh, has uh, Dr. C.K. Ponte joined? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, Dr. C.K. Ponte, can you take over further to introduce yes. our uh, uh, other international faculty yes. and uh, Professor Ram? Yes. Uh, thank you all of you. It has been an honor and privilege to be here and to introduce our um, uh, foreign speakers. Uh, the first speaker, which we have none other than Dr. Franz Mazzarelli, who is a concern. Professor Swiss Cardiovascular Center Burn. We all have heard him in several forums. He's a director of clinical research at the Oshner Medical Institutions and clinical professor of medicine at Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans. He has served several 
several uh, cardio renal advisory committee of the food and drug administration fda he has been a member of the editorial boards of jack european heart journal circulation hypertension american journal of cardiology journal of hypertension etc uh, if you see the biodata it must be weighing a ton by now <laughs> has published more than 900 publications the most cited researcher uh, uh, in in the world for his scientific achievements dr mazarelli has received several awards amongst them honoris causa doctorate from the uh, uh, jigulion university in krakow poland and alberto zanchesti life achievement award for the european society of hypertension so uh, welcome sir and uh, sir will be sharing us uh, his views on the uh, uh, role of chlorothiazide in stroke prevention Thank you, Dr. Prabhu. Then we have our own uh, doc, uh, Dr. C. Venkata Ram. Uh, Dr. C. Venkata Ram has been known to us for now decades and he's done such a pioneering work in the field of hypertension. He's the director currently of Apollo Institute for Blood Pressure Management and Professor of Apollo Medical College. He's the director of World Hypertension League, South Asia region, professor of clinical medicine, University of Texas, Southwestern Medical Center, He is a director, Texas Medical, uh, Texas Blood Pressure Institute, Dallas, USA. We have heard him in several national uh, uh, conferences, several webinars, and several CMEs. And his uh, views, his fundamental research in hypertension, has always been extremely uh, invigorating and touching. He is a dean, uh, Macquarie Institute Medical School, Sydney, Australia. He is the editor in chief of the Hypertension Journal and received Padma Shri Award from the Indian government for his work in hypertension and prevention of heart disease. So, Dr. Venkat Ram will be uh, giving us a complete uh, view on yesterday, today, and tomorrow for chlorothiazide. Then we have uh, Dr. Thomas Lusher. He is the chairman of the Center of Molecular Cardiology at the University of Zurich. He is an editor of the ESC textbook of cardiovascular medicine. He was an editor chief of the European Heart Journal for almost a decade and continues to be involved as a senior editor. He is a founding editor of official journal of Swiss Society of Cardiology. He is amongst the most uh, half a percent of most cited scientists worldwide. Professor Lucher has been the mentor for numerous physicians, scientists from around the world, with many of them holding chairs and directorships in Switzerland, Europe. And even Asia. So, welcome, Dr. Thomas Lusher, and he'll be sharing us his views on uh, use of chlorothiazide for uh, prevention of heart failure. Next, please. And then we have our own Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, Professor of Medicine, Indiana University, an internationally recognized leader in the area of clinical translational research in nephrology, has published more than 250 papers and reviews in nephrology. He serves on the editorial board of. Kidney International Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology, editor in Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, American Journal of Nephrology and Journal of American Society of Hypertension. He is a recipient of Excellence in Clinical Science Award from the American Nephrologists of Indian Origin. Serves on the board of directors of kidney disease, improving global outcome, Kidigo, and serves as a panelist for Medical Evidence Development uh, Coverage Advisory Committee. Uh, for several years. So welcome Dr. Agarwal. And now I hand over uh, uh, to Dr. Venkata Ram to conduct the proceedings. Thank you very much, uh, CK. Uh, we, we can start with the program very quickly, but uh, I, I do want to mention uh, something. It is uh, my, uh, my conscience to say something. Uh, it is very, uh, because 5,000 people are logged in, 2,500 in various conference rooms, and 2,500 people are logged in uh, on the Zoom. Uh, it's uh, very unusual. Uh, remove me. You, you, you can filter me out, minus me. But uh, the, the faculty, the Indian faculty and uh, faculty from abroad, ladies and gentlemen, is truly outstanding. Uh, these are the people who have given their professional life for advancement of scientific basis for clinical practice. And that is what we need. 
uh, I have not, uh, for example, you know, we go to meetings, but we go from conference A to conference B room. We hear somebody for five minutes, then we go to somebody else. Then we go to another conference room. We keep on moving from one conference hall to other. We never sit down unless you are a core chairperson. But this is a very great opportunity that we are all able to sit down at one place and not moving in the corridors here and there, uh, chit-chatting with people, great opportunity, uh, wonderful speakers that we have. And I, I certainly encourage the audience uh, to stay attentive and to make your remarks during the robust uh, discussion period that we have allocated towards the end. Uh, and then with those remarks, I will uh, now ask uh, Tom, to, Tom Lusher, to, to lead the program uh, with his uh, topic that was already spelled out by Dr. Pondi. Thank you very much, uh, Mintaka. Um, I'm de delighted to be here and to uh, talk uh, on heart failure prevention and role of chlorothaladone. And uh, obviously this is a uh, drug that has been underused, particularly in Europe. Uh, although I must say my father who used to be a, a general practitioner in Zurich, he has used it. And when I uh, worked for him, when he was on holidays, I got to know the drug, but uh, I haven't seen many patients. Uh, 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 getting it uh, in, in Switzerland and the UK where I work now. So it is a good time to uh, reconsider uh, this medication. Well, first of all, why are diuretics useful in heart failure? You can see here a patient with heart failure with uh, congestion in the lungs uh, and uh, peripheral edema. So we do have, of course, water and sodium retention the kidney is almost as important as the heart, uh, if not more uh, in heart failure, particularly in heart failure, redu reduced ejection fraction. There's increased pulmonary pressure that uh, leads to dyspnea. There can be pulmonary edema. And of course, eventually, uh, many people have also right heart failure and peripheral edema. Right uh, heart failure is always a consequence, not always, uh, but often, uh, in most patients, a consequence of left heart failure. And so uh, diuretics that uh, counteract wa water and sodium retention are in principle well-placed uh, in, in uh, heart failure in the management. And uh, this is a patient uh, with pulmonary uh, congestion. And of course, uh, in acute heart failure in particular, diuretics are extremely important and life-saving, although this has not been tested in a randomized fashion. Now, when we look at when the heart pumps less well as it should, as in this very patient, then of course, uh, pressures uh, go up, uh, filling pressures go up and eventually pressure in the lung uh, will go uh, up uh, as a consequence of it. Uh, there is uh, even, uh, of course, uh, water in the alveoli, uh, uh, at a certain uh, uh, pulmonary pressure. And then of course, eventually also the right heart may fail. And so there is a huge water overflow uh, in the circulation. And uh, cortalidone of course is a drug that works primarily in uh, stable uh, patients with either a risk for heart failure or uh, overt heart failure. And of course, uh, the question is where does it work? It works in the kidney, obviously. Uh, it works on the uh, sodium uh, chloride uh, supporter in the apical membrane of the distal convoluted uh, uh, tubulus that you see here on the left-hand side in a blue, uh, beautiful schematic uh, that uh, published in the uh, uh, New England some time ago. It inhibits multiple isoforms of uh, carbonic anhydrase as well. So basically, uh, it is a, a drug with uh, several uh, actions in the kidney, and I'm sure we will hear more from our nephrology colleagues uh, on this uh, very fact. Now, where does uh, chlorotolidone work in heart failure? We have, of course, heart failure as a condition where we see the patient with overt heart failure where he needs diuretics. 
or patients that are uh, have been hospitalized to prevent another hospitalization, hospitalization or early deaths. But of course, uh, hypertension is a risk factor for heart failure. And uh, in the most of the studies I will discuss, it is uh, about prevention of heart failure uh, and uh, rather than management of heart failure. And of course, as uh, most uh, no, uh, prevention is, is, is better than treatment. And so we should consider that hypertension. Obviously, uh, it, this is focusing on hypertension today as a risk factor for heart failure. We all know that uh, diabetes and lipids are very important as well, leading to ischemic cardiomyopathies and eventually heart failure as well. But hypertension itself can lead to heart failure without uh, um, coronary artery disease. So it is an important risk factor for heart failure and therefore deserves to be discussed uh, uh, tonight uh, and also uh, be tested in large randomized trials as has been uh, the uh, case in the past. So when we look at heart failure, we can really say that when we talk particularly about half ref, but uh, also to some degree also in half PEF, uh, so that is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The kidney is equally important as the heart. Uh, when the heart fails, the kidney feels it. In fact, the, the kidney has the impression that he has to uh, retain water and sodium and uh, activate the renin angiotensin system to increase peripheral vascular resistance to maintain blood pressure. And then, of course, as a consequence, that overloads the heart and uh, cardiac uh, performance further decreases, which is a vicious cycle that we tend to interrupt with when we, uh, when we treat patients with uh, beta blockers, RAS inhibitors, RNA, but also, of course, uh, diuretics such as mineral corticoid antagonists, but also, uh, obviously, uh, uh, diuretics such as chlorotalidone or others. So when we look at the um, data that I will show uh, from uh, the uh, whole, uh, trials, we have to consider again that we have two forms of heart failure. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, usually in the range of below 40 or 35 percent. Le left ventricular and diastolic pressure is quite uh, um, increase, there's remodeling, there's scar, uh, blood pressure tends to be uh, lower and BNP uh, increased. On the left side, we see a patient with a half PEF that has actually good or even extremely good ejection fraction and still has a, a pleural effusion that you can see here uh, uh, on this part of, of the scan. And in the middle, we have now also heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction or HEFMREF that has now been defined by the most recent 2021 uh, guidelines as mildly reduced ejection fraction. So basically the spectrum goes from below 60% to a mildly reduced ejection fraction to true heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, usually below 40%, while HEFPEF is considered uh, to be uh, in the range uh, from uh, 50 to 60 or even 70 percent. And it's a quite a heterogeneous disease. When we look at the mortality of these two heart failure forms uh, with preserved or reduced ejection fraction, as defined by the uh, guidelines shown again down here below, uh, the, Caroline Lamb has published this uh, uh, with patients mainly uh, from Southeast Asia. And you can see on the top, the mortality, and you can see that patients with HEFREF have the worst prognosis, obviously, and then uh, HEFPEF ha has also not a very favorable outcome, but it is better than those uh, with uh, have, uh, um, REF. And this also applies for the composite uh, endpoints, uh, deaths and hospitalization for heart failure in panel B. So when we look at the major outcomes in the high-risk hypertension randomized trial uh, to angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors of calcium of uh, channel blockers versus diuretic, the LHAT trial, 
published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2002. We can say that it's 20 years now. And so it's a very good moment to talk about this uh, uh, again uh, in uh, more detail. So as you all know, the uh, trial uh, recruited a lot of patients. Um, 15,000 patients were assigned to chlortalidone, around 9,000 each uh, to lisinopril and amlodipine, and another 9,000 to an alpha blocker, doxazosine, uh, that uh, turned out to be a, a difficult arm, uh, as we will, I'm sure, discuss uh, later uh, in this uh, 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 webinar. So when we look at this, um, very paper that has been published in circulation in 2008 on heart failure with uh, uh, preserved and reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, in the ALHAD trial by Barry Davis and co workers. It is a very important paper because it also uh, focuses on different forms of heart failure that I just introduced uh, in the previous slides. And here we look at hospitalizations uh, with chlortalidone versus lisinopril or amlodipine. You can see overall hospitalizations in the left panel. And uh, it is uh, quite obvious that indeed uh, uh, chlortalidone looks better uh, than, uh, 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 than amlodipine and uh, lisinopril. Uh, the ACE inhibitor is better than amlodipine here in this very figure. And uh, when we looked at those with reduced ejection fraction, uh, you can see that obviously a calcium antagonist is less favorable than an ACE inhibitor and uh, chlorotalidone. So that's uh, a very important uh, uh, finding. Of course, uh, we know that uh, ACE inhibitors are very effective uh, in, uh, in getting uh, in, in patient uh, uh, treated uh, to, 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 to be treated with a, a condition we now call half ref and uh, earlier it was just heart failure at large. And then uh, we have uh, patients with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, this is on the left panel here. Again, uh, you can see with the solid lines, chlortalidone uh, with the dashed lines, uh, um, uh, amlodipine and uh, lisinopril with the dotted lines. And you see that actually uh, in preserved ejection fraction, it, it, it really uh, reduces the cumulative uh, rate of hospitalizations. So also in patients with uh, preserved ejection fraction, water and sodium retention is very important and contributes to the overfilling of the heart, the dyspnea, and even uh, pleural effusion, as we've shown earlier, uh, in these patient population. Now then uh, there are also patients with no uh, ejection fraction data. And of course, this is much more dirty and uh, we have to look at this with uh, some um, caution, but again, the solid line looks favorable uh, under these conditions. Then comes uh, doxazosine is an alpha blocker, alpha one blocker, as you know, that has been tested in the LHAT. And uh, indeed, hospitalizations for heart failure here, chlortalidone again in the solid line, that the uh, xazosine in the dashed lines. You can see that the cumulative rate of heart failure hospitalizations on the left panel is hugely different between the two treatment options. So clearly, chlortalidone is superior uh, to the, the alpha blocker. Uh, this is uh, particularly seen in patients with reduced ejection fraction on the uh, left uh, right uh, panel, as you can see. And then uh, um, preserved ejection fraction again, dexosazine looks worse than uh, chlortalidone as you would expect. And then uh, of, on the uh, right panel, we have also again a cohort where no ejection fraction data were available because they all know this is an NIH, NIH uh, funded trial that was had a restricted budget that therefore uh, we don't have uh, full complete data as we would uh, uh, expect, of course. Mortality looks not so exciting really. Here you see the mortality rate for reduced ejection fraction, which was defined as below 50%. 
This is a bit different than uh, the current guidelines that I introduced earlier, where it would be 40, less than 40 percent ejection fraction. But of course, we have to take the data as they are. On the left panel, you see cumulative mortality rate, again, over the uh, five-year period. And uh, the uh, chlorotalidone in the solid line, amlodipine, lisinopril, uh, looked very, very similar, which is, of course, a bit surprising, particularly as regards uh, the ACE inhibitor uh, and amlodipine, you wouldn't have expected to do so well, but there's a very, very good antihypertensive drug. So in spite of the fact that it doesn't interfere with water and sodium retention or with the, uh, the renin angiotensin system, it uh, looked uh, rather good in the long run. On the right uh, panel, we see mortality rate with no ejection fraction data by treatment group uh, doesn't look uh, much different uh, uh, under these conditions. And also the lisinopril tended to look even worse, but this is of course a data set where we don't know what uh, patient group we talk about really. This is uh, now mortality rate with preserved ejection fraction, which was uh, defined above 50%. Uh, ejection fraction by treatment group. Again, you can see under these conditions, amlodipine looks better. Uh, obviously, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a hallmark of hypertension. And as uh, amlodipine is a very, very effective antihypertensive drug, uh, this data have to be taken as is. It is a bit surprising for many but it's, it's clear cut. And the mortality rate was reduced ejection fraction uh, by treatment group uh, on the left with the dexosazine was not different. Then uh, uh, we have uh, mortality rate with preserved ejection fraction, chlorotalidone versus the, that, the, the uh, doxazazine didn't look different surprisingly. Uh, and we can discuss that later on uh, where we have no ejection fraction again on the right panel, no difference. Although so, with uh, you know the, the numbers get then very small at the end, where there seems to be a divergent. Okay, and then uh, of course there were other uh, analyses, uh, not really trials. I mean, again, what I showed you with Alhad is a randomized trial. That's the hot, the best evidence we can get. Um, uh, there was no placebo group, obviously, because this uh, was considered unethical. And here um, we uh, will discuss this probably more in detail later on by the others. But uh, this uh, paper published in the JAMA Internal Medicine, and there was also a Lancet paper, comparison of cardiovascular and safety outcomes of chlorotalidone versus hydrochlorothiazide. Now, this is not a randomized trial. And you can see this is a large scale evidence generation and evaluation in a network of databases, so-called legend observational comparative uh, study uh, that uh, compared chlorotalidone, obviously much uh, lower numbers because uh, hydrochlorothiazide is much more used uh, worldwide. Uh, chlorotalidone had 36,000 uh, patients Again, this is a comparison that, uh, that eventually was also uh, using propensity analysis because it's not randomized and therefore to be taken with some caution. Hydrochlorothiazide, almost 700,000 patients. They were all dispensed or prescribed. So we don't know whether they really took the drug, but of course we're never 100% sure of that uh, you know, also in trials and had uh, 100, uh, around 150 uh, outcome events in chlorotalidone and uh, more than 3,000 in hydrochlorothiazide. And then of course they did uh, a propensity analysis to assure that the two uh, groups uh, were more or less aligned, which initially in panel A, they are not. And uh, when they uh, then uh, looked at all the outcomes with a calibrated uh, hazard ratio, you can see uh, uh, on the left side of the line of identity with the dashed line favors chlorotalidone. On the right side it, side, it would favor hydrochlorothiazide. And essentially, there were no differences, except there was a small questionable difference in cardiac arrhythmia. We will see 
that in this particular analysis, there was more hypokalemia. Maybe that <laughs> could be a, a, an effect that uh, really uh, is real. Syncope was more pronounced, uh, maybe because chlorotalidone is a better antihypertensive, but the effect size was small. And hospitalizations for heart failure did not differ. Contrary to the ALHAT trial, which was, as I said, a randomized trial. And uh, safety data can be of interest in such an analysis. And here uh, we see, first of all, um, the um, events. There, were, there was actually uh, acute uh, renal failure was favored by chlortalidone. Uh, diabetes also small effect sizes though in this analysis and then uh, we uh, can see that uh, hyperkalemia uh, hyponatremia were more prominent uh, with uh, chlortalidone that is it favored uh, hydrochlorothiazides and um, and eventually here this is an anaphylactic uh, uh, event rate that was quite dominant, uh, but uh, don't know what that means. Then there was another paper published in hypertension in 2012, like 10 years ago, on uh, chlorocalidone uh, compared with hydrochlorothiazides. Uh, this is a systematic review and network meta-analysis. And of course, this is again, not a randomized trial. And meta-analysis, as uh, Franz Messerli put it, uh, uh, is like a booyah bass and one rotten fish made it uh, may, uh, can make it stink. So we have to really look at this also with some uh, reservation. And, uh, but you can see in the lines that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, in, uh, that uh, compare the relative risk of cardiovascular events and uh, the difference in mean uh, achieved uh, office systolic blood pressure in the diuretic versus control the uh, lines uh, is in favor of chlortalidone in this particular analysis. And when they uh, actually looked at the deep different events uh, for uh, drug adjusted uh, pooled network and uh, um, uh, drug uh, adjusted uh, amlodipine network and ACE inhibitor networks, it is all in favor of chlortalidone, CTDN uh, abbreviated uh, compared to uh, hydrochlorothiazide. So this very analysis is more in line with ALHAT, uh, but again, it's a systematic review and the network meta-analysis and not the randomized trials, but they concluded in this paper that hydrochlorothiazide and chlortalidin reduces cardiovascular event by 21%, a result that is highly significant, uh, statistically significant with a p-value of 0001. Okay. So that's what we can say for that. Uh, if you want to hear more about heart failure and cardiovascular medicine, this is what I just published in, at Oxford University Press, which is a, a manual for rounds where all the, re, the guidelines to treat heart failure are updated and contain the, the, the re, most recent guidelines uh, of 21. So with this, I'm uh, handing over to uh, the chairperson and then uh, later the discussion. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for uh, at least putting together the data uh, as published uh, by major trials uh, and also uh, meta-analysis despite the differences in quantity of numbers in each one, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you painted a, a broad picture of diuretics and heart failure and the role of uh, different diuretics. Now, we'll go to another uh, organ, uh, which is a obviously the main target uh, for the treatment of hypertension uh, is the brain, because of all the complications, the, the correlation between the actual blood pressure uh, and uh, complication is via brain. Heart is multifactorial. CKD, with due respect to Rajiv Agarwal, could be over and beyond hypertension. They have diabetes and all these things. But stroke is really linearly related to blood pressure, one of the few complications. And uh, after Dr. Franz Meserly uh, talk on stroke, then Rajiv Agarwal is going to talk because uh, Ra Raj Rajiv feels 
that the heart of the matter is always in the kidney. Therefore, we'll save that to him. So, Franz, uh, please uh, discuss on stroke prevention. Uh, and, and then all the uh, questions for the speakers will be during the discussion period. Thanks so much, Rev. Cronop. Delighted to be here. And uh, this is just about the view that I'm presently having from my little uh, apartment here in, in Oberhof. Now, uh, don't be afraid. I'm not going to talk about Roosevelt. This story uh, I have presented quite a few times in India, and there's no reason to repeat it. I published it in the New England Journal quite some time ago. But what I'd like to make sure is that you understand Roosevelt died of a stroke. And he was actually smoking, had hypertension, and had a stroke at age 63. And when you look at Stalin, he died at age 75, also smoking, hypertension, and also had a stroke. And Churchill, actually, the same story. He died a little bit later, but he smoked, had hypertension, and also obviously died of a stroke. So this series of cases very neatly illustrates the dictum of Sir George Pickering, stroke, regardless whether ischemic or hemorrhagic, is the most devastating complication of hypertensive cardiovascular disease. And if I had to ask you right now, this is a very educated audience, right now, would you, if you had to wake up tomorrow morning with a heart attack or a stroke, who takes actually a stroke? And I'm sure that nobody uh, would take a stroke. Most of us would way prefer to have a heart attack. So special attention must be paid to the elderly. That's a given these days. But look at this, antihypertensive agents produce no obvious benefits in patients over 65. Lancet 74. Or this, brown mold. Systolic hypertension, the presence of a normal or reduced diastolic is rarely considered responsible for target organ disease. By today's standard, absolutely terrible. Well, obviously, today's standards were governed by the SHEP study. And in the SHEP, uh, Antihypertension, SHEP stands for systolic hypertension in the elderly. You can see here there was a drastic reduction in ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke by just about 36%. SHEP was clotalidone based. And then we have SISTU and adrenaline based, 42% reduction of stroke. And we have high bed in that by 30% reduction of stroke. So three independent prospective randomized trial showing that blood pressure reduction reduces stroke. And uh, here comes George Patrick and said, well, come on, any drug that lowers blood pressure will reduce stroke. Uh, well, George, not so fast, not so fast. This is a trial nobody ever talks about, the Dutch TIA trial. The authors looked at about 1,400 aspirin-treated patients with TIA or ischemic stroke, randomized to a tenolol or placebo, followed for two and a half years. And as you can see, blood pressure was lowered very nicely by a tenolol. These were the results. Absolutely no effect whatsoever. So despite lowering blood pressure, a tenolol does not reduce the risk of stroke. But of course, they had side effects of a tenolol. And the side effects were hypertension, bradycardia, impotence, shortness of breath, fatigue, dizziness, cold extremities. No effect, just side effects. So several independent study documents, despite lowering pressure beta blockers, do not reduce the risk of stroke. And of course, you can also find this in a meta-analysis uh, or in a Cochrane review. We don't need to, uh, to ex expand on this any further. Now, Allow me to make you another point here. This is a study uh, published seven years ago that actually is intriguing. What is not intriguing is this here. As you go from normal tension to pre-hypertension to stage one, stage two hypertension, your risk of stroke goes up. That's a given. We have learned that in kindergarten or at least in medical school. Now, what we did not learn so well in kindergarten is that 
where patients are perfectly normal tensing below 120, but on one antihypertensive, two antihypertensive, and three antihypertensive, the risk of stroke is almost as high as those who are not on antihypertensive or have stage one or even stage two hypertension, which means very simply that maintaining the normal tensive status to pharmacologically fail to return the risk level similar to normal tensive individuals. Even with successful treatment, there's a substantial residual risk. In other words, when you go from pre hypertension to stage one, stage two hypertension, your cardiovascular risk goes up. And when you then re reduce the blood pressure, we think, we hope that this risk will go down to where it was previously, but this is not the case. There's a distinct residual risk here, as you can see. And the question is, of course, why do we have this, such a residual risk? Well, one point is very simple. Despite lowering blood pressure, beta blockers do not reduce the risk of stroke. You could lower the blood pressure with etanolol, but the risk of stroke is not reduced. This is what happens when you give a beta blocker. The residual risk is just basically unchanged. And therefore, as long as we use traditional beta blockers for the treatment of hypertension, we will not reduce the risk of stroke. We merely create a sense of false security. Yes, blood pressure is controlled, patient is happy, doctor is happy, but the risk of stroke is not. Okay, Tom has, Tom Lucia has talked about all that, and I would like to do that too. I'd like to remind you, this is the primary endpoint. And you can see here, Clotalidone, Amlodipine, Lisinopril, absolutely no difference. Now, why is everybody always talking talking about all that, well, it's the largest hypertension study ever done. Initially, just about 40,000 patients. So the primary endpoint was basically coronary heart disease, fatal coronary heart disease or non-fatal MI. When we look at stroke, you can see here, there is a distinct difference. Lysinopril is lousy, whereas amlodipine sorry, amlodipine and um, clotalidone do exceedingly well, significantly better than lisinopril. Well, I found this intriguing at that time. So we wrote this paper, two thiazide diuretics for the first specific protection against stroke. Since stroke is the most devastating sequela of high blood pressure, our data strongly favor the use of low-dose diuretics, he said at that time, either as initial therapy or in combination to reduce this risk. And this is a recent paper looking at, again, meta-analysis, Bouillabaisse, as Thomas said, um, meta-analysis of uh, 93 randomized trials. But look at this. Basically, this is a cluster ranking on the x-axis, x-x axis is efficacy, on the y-axis tolerability. And you can see here that diuretics, CCB, CCB, and diuretics, or ARB and diuretics, do far better in reducing stroke than placebo, beta blockers, renin inhibitors, or ACE inhibitors. So clearly, if you want to use, or if you want to prevent stroke, you basically should use a diuretic, a thiazide diuretic. Does it make which? And does it make a difference? Well, we did a paper here, Anil Parikh uh, and myself, uh, just about uh, when was this? About uh, I don't see the date. Oh, 16, six. So it is uh, six, six years ago. And what we actually did, we looked at 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring with hydrochlorothiazide and chlorthalidone. And as you can see here. During the office blood pressure window, doctor patient window, that is from six o'clock in the morning till four in the afternoon, there's absolutely no difference between chlorothalidone and hydrochlorothiazide. But when you look at the additional 12 hours, that is during the night and early morning hours, hydrochlorothiazide loses its efficacy, whereas chlorothalidone 
uh, continues to reduce blood pressure very nicely. So a very nice difference between hydrochlorothiazide and clothalidone. This was prospective randomized double blind with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So again, office blood pressure, no difference between hydrochlorothiazide and clothalidone. But when you then look at 24 hour BP, um, hydrochlorothiazide did not eat even significantly lower the blood pressure. And of course, nighttime blood pressure was not lowered either. Our conclusion was treatment with low dose clothalidone, 6.25 daily, significantly reduced 24 hour ambulatory BP, as well as daytime and nighttime BP. In contrast, no 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure reduction was seen with hydrochlorothiazide, 12 and a half milligrams. And we said that actually low dose hydrochlorothiazide should no longer be considered an acceptable therapeutic option, at least in monotherapy in hypertension. This is important because, as we all know, when you look at the early warning hours, this is exactly when the risk of stroke and heart attack and sudden cardiac death is highest. Now, it doesn't mean that it's blood pressure dependent, but it behooves us to lower blood pressure at that time as good as we possibly can. And hydrochlorothiazide does not do it, whereas clotalidone actually does. And we come here to the underlying mechanism, back to the underlying mechanism of the residual risk. First of all, uh, second of all, the irreversible damage, but also the incomplete blood pressure reduction over 24 hours, as we have seen with hydrochlorothiazide. I come back to the SHEP study here. And remember, as we, I have shown you, the relative risk of stroke was reduced by 36% with clotalidone based therapy, highly statistically significant. Now, allow me to ask you a question. Of every 100 patients with isolated systolic hypertension, uh, how many were actually randomized to either clotalidone or placebo? 75 to 150, 25, 10, less than 10. Well, that's a good question because obviously there are always dropouts when you, when you, uh, you know, until you randomize. Of every 100 patients who were contacted, um, 12 met the initial study criteria, three completed the baseline visit, and one, one underwent randomization. One out of a hundred, ladies and gentlemen. Now, look at this. This is general cardiovascular health study. And you look at concomitant comorbid, comorbid conditions like MRI, heart failure, stroke, diabetes. Look at this in the elderly, in the family home cohort, in the nursing home population, and in sepsis, sepsis, China. Um, and sprint, you can see here, it's much, much lower. Patients in clinical trials are not representative of the majority of elderly patients. Evidence gathered in such trials should be cautiously applied in clinical practice. This is your elderly hypertensive patient in the trial and this as well. And this is actually the patient, the real patient, you and I are treating the elderly. Okay. Now, John Costi is a good friend of mine, did actually a nice paper here in JAMA. He looked, you know, SHEP was a long time ago, so we have a long follow-up now, and they studied the gain in life expectancy, randomized to active therapy, 20, uh, 22 years follow-up. And you can see here that receiving active therapy one month gives you one additional day free of cardiovascular death. Which means if you are on clotalidone for 30 years, your life expectancy is increased approximately by one year. Now, this is very good. But look at this. And allow me to ask you again the question. Overall life expectancy in treated hypertensive patients was longer as long or shorter as in age and gender match normotensive cohort. Well, this seems to be a no-brainer, so to speak. You can see here, it's almost uh, uh, two and a half years uh, longer. 
but where you have a little bit more problem understanding um, the idea when you look at untreated hypertension check, is now the life expectancy longer, as long, shorter as the one in an age and gender match cohort. As you can see here, it's also about two and a half uh, years long. And these are untreated hypertensive patients. And compared to a normal tensive cohort, and here, these are the data. You can see here that on the, the top line here is SHEP, placebo, and treated. And here, the bottom line is a age and gender match cohort. So in other words, trial participation confers longevity regardless whether you are placebo or active medication. And uh, A.B. Hill has said, any belief the control trials is the only way would mean not that the pendulum has swung too much to the right, but it has gone right off the hook. So the, tri the randomized trial, as good as important it is, it's not the ultimate wisdom. Let me... Uh, well, let me make one more little point here. Let me, let me just keep this way. Okay, this is a very nice paper that is actually in press or just on about in the way coming out, looking at the hallmarks of thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. And remember, it started very early. Clotalidone was approved in Switzerland in 1960. And they also look at the future, and that gives us actually a, uh, an idea of what's happening ne uh, next year. In the VA cooperative study, we will have a randomized trial, hydrochlorothiazide versus clothalidone, hopefully in 20, uh, 2023. And obviously that will give us a uh, answer. I presume that uh, what Anil, uh, Anil Pavik and myself have uh, fabricated uh, will be confirmed, but uh, we are never quite so sure um, what, what's happening. Okay, so in the US, we only have 25 milligrams of clothalidone, and it's hard to break it because the, uh, the pill uh, crumbles. In Switzerland, uh, actually clothalidone was discovered, launched first, in the 1960s, as it just told, it's no longer available. We have, we have clothalidone, it's not available in Switzerland. If I put the patient on clothalidone, we have to import it either from India or from Germany, most often from Germany, but it's not available. In India, it's available in 6.25, 12 and a half, and 25 milligrams, and it's available in all kinds of combinations. So Indian physicians are actually spoiled. I think that is excellent news. Now, allow me to make one more point before I conclude. You know, and this is about the non-pharmacologic intervention. And I know all the guidelines always rhapsodize on these. There's nothing wrong about rhapsodizing on these, but my way of treating is the John Wayne approach. What do I mean by the John Wayne approach? The John Wayne approach is shoot first, that's what you want to do, and ask questions later. Shoot first, once hypertension is identified, drug therapy is mandatory. Just to, if, you, if you are convinced this patient has hypertension, start antihypertensive therapy. Lifestyle intervention can be concomitantly advised and maybe complementary. And if blood pressure is too low after weight loss and, and a low salt diet, Drug therapy can be downtrodden or discontinued. Okay, allow me to conclude with a painting from Juan Miro that actually has in the uh, Rosenberg Gallery in Lutzen, Switzerland, dancer with the heart here, and a Rolex Oyster Perpetual and Ernest Hemingway. What do they have in common? They have in common the dictum of Hemingway on the heart, it is just a muscle. Only it's the main muscle, it works as perfectly as the Rolex voice to perpetual. Trouble is you cannot send it to the Rolex representative when it goes wrong. When it stops, you just don't know the time you are dead. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Franz, for uh, again covering the data as, uh, as published. Some are randomized, some are not randomized, different doses. But nevertheless, it's a very broad, broad landscape of data relating to blood pressure reduction uh, with diuretic-based therapy and uh, stroke. And uh, in the time that I have, I am going to just supplement what you have done by covering a little bit of data from the sprint uh, uh, later on during my talk. Now, uh, it's really a great pleasure. Dr. Rajiv Agarwal has already been introduced uh, very nicely, but I just want to make one point that uh, uh, the top uh, Harvard of India, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and we have two, two people from there on the faculty now, Dr. Kerr, uh, who, who will be the panelist, and of course, the, one of the distinguished alumni of All India Institute of Medical Sciences and a very distinguished scientist now globally in nephrology, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal. Rajiv? Thank you, Dr. Ram, for the introduction. I actually have uh, prepared a video so we, the viewers can have a better experience than seeing me live. I pre-recorded the video and I'll ask the sponsors to play. Hello, I'm Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, Professor of Medicine at Indiana University School of Medicine and Staff Physician at the VA Medical Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. I thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present the results of a randomized controlled trial, chlorothaladone in advanced chronic kidney disease, CLIC. 11% of the world's population has chronic kidney disease. Few patients who reach stage four CKD dread the specter of dialysis, yet these people are often excluded from randomized trials. Small non-randomized interventional studies found that the treatment with thiazide diuretics was effective. Small randomized trials in patients with CKD also found efficacy. The largest had 23 patients. However, it is a common belief that thiazides are ineffective in advanced CKD and clinical guidelines prefer loop diuretic once GFR falls to less than 30. Chlorothaladone was approved by the FDA in 1960 for the treatment of hypertension. In 2014, we reported a pilot study of 14 patients with moderate to advanced CKD and found that 24-hour systolic blood pressure can be improved by 10 and a half millimeters mercury over 12 weeks with a starting dose of 25 milligrams chlorothaladone. Encouraged by these preliminary data, we designed a randomized control trial the hypothesis that we tested was that among patients with advanced CKD, chlorothaladone will result in improved 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure and albuminuria over 12 weeks, and it will do so by shrinking the extracellular fluid volume. We included patients with stage 4 CKD who had poorly controlled hypertension as diagnosed by 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. They all had to be treated with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or a beta blocker. After informed consent, we observed patients for three weeks. There was a one-week screening phase and a two-week run-in phase. During the screening phase, we asked patients to measure the blood pressure twice daily at home. During the two-week run-in phase, we prescribed antihypertensive medications such that each patient received a preferred medication for each of the five major medication classes. We also prescribed a single blind placebo once daily. When they returned, we performed an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for 24 hours. If they met inclusion exclusion criteria, they were randomized to either chlorothaladone or placebo. Randomization was stratified by loop diuretic use. In the first four weeks, each patient received either 12.5 milligrams chlorothaladone or placebo. We doubled the dose of the study drug every four weeks based on home blood pressure to a maximum of 50 milligrams chlorothaladone daily. The last visit for randomized treatment was 12 weeks, at which time ambulatory blood pressure monitoring was performed. 
The study medication was discontinued. The patient returned two weeks later. Additional consent was obtained for observational annual follow-up for subsequent three years. At each of the clinic visits, at randomization and subsequently, we obtained USCR, serum chemistries, and EGFR. We also measured markers of effective arterial blood volume, renin, aldosterone, and anti-proBNP and total body volume using total body plethysmography. The primary outcome was the stratification variable adjusted change from baseline to 12 weeks in systolic ambulatory blood pressure in the chlorothaladone group compared to placebo. Secondary outcomes were the stratification variable adjusted change from baseline at each four-week visit in the chlorothaladone group compared to placebo for log-transformed USCR anti-proBNP renin and aldo. Our study was powered to detect a six millimeter difference between groups in systolic ambulatory blood pressure after accounting for up to 20% dropout. 79 patients received placebo, 81 chlorothaladone. 92% of those on placebo provided a final ambulatory blood pressure. 83% of those on chlorothaladone provided a final ambulatory blood pressure. Therefore, 88% of those who participated in the trial had a valuable 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure data. Average age was 66.5 years, 22% were women, 58% white, 40% black, and 1% each Asian and Hispanic. At baseline, 76% had underlying diabetes, 33% had a history of hospitalized heart failure, 24% had a history of prior myocardial infarction, 23% a history of prior stroke. EGFR averaged 23.2 mils per minute, 67% of the patients had macro, 24% micro, and 9% absence of albuminuria at baseline. The distribution of USCR was balanced between groups. After five minutes of seated rest without an observer in the room, automated oscillometric clinic blood pressure averaged 140 over 69 millimeters mercury. Patients were on 3.4 antihypertensive medications, 60% were on loop diuretics, and 99% were on ACE, ARB, or a beta blocker. Clinic systolic blood pressure was similar at baseline. Over the 12-week randomized phase, blood pressure remained stable with placebo, but dropped with chlorothaladone. At four weeks, the between-group difference was 11.9 millimeters, and at 12 weeks was 15.1 millimeters. Once the drug was stopped, blood pressure increased in the chlorothaladone group, but even after two weeks of no chlorothaladone, blood pressure in the chlorothaladone group was 12.3 millimeters lower compared to placebo. At four weeks, chlorothaladone group had lost 1.5 kilo weight. At 12 weeks, 2.1 kilos. After two weeks of being off drug, the chlorothaladone group still had 1.4 kilo lower weight compared to placebo. At baseline, 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure was similar between groups. The adjusted drop from baseline at 12 weeks was 0.5 millimeters in the placebo group and 11 millimeters in the chlorothaladone group. Between group difference was 10.5 millimeters mercury with a p-value of less than 1 in 10,000. Ambulatory systolic blood pressure was similarly reduced during the wake and sleep states. 24-hour ambulatory diastolic blood pressure was reduced by 3.9 millimeters mercury with similar reductions during the wake and sleep states Dipping status was therefore not altered by chlorothaladone. I will now present the secondary endpoints. Urine albumin to urine creatinine ratio was similar at baseline. Over the 12-week randomized phase, USCR was stable with placebo. However, it dropped with chlorothaladone. With chlorothaladone at four weeks, USCR was 36% lower, and at 12 weeks was 50% lower. Once the drug was stopped, USCR increased in chlorothaladone group, but even after two weeks of stopping chlorothaladone, USCR in the chlorothaladone group was 34% lower. Anti-proBNP dropped with chlorothaladone compared to placebo at 12 weeks. It was 
21% lower and after stopping the drug was still 20% lower. As expected renin increased with chlorothaladone compared to placebo at 12 weeks, it was 42% higher but after stopping the drug returned to baseline. As expected, plasma aldosterone increased with chlorothaladone compared to placebo at 12 weeks, it was 41% higher and after stopping the drug, returned to baseline. Adverse events and serious adverse events were balanced between groups. Four in chlorothaladone and one in placebo stopped the drug permanently. The reasons for permanent discontinuations are listed here. Chlorothaladone was associated with more hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypomagnesemia, hyperglycemia, and hyperuricemia, but less hyperkalemia. Symptomatic orthostatic hypotension and syncope were also more common with chlorothaladone. At least a 25% increase in serum creatinine concentration from baseline was seen in 13% in the placebo group and 45% in the chlorothaladone group. The incidence of reversible changes in serum creatinine was strongly influenced by loop diuretic use. In those on a loop diuretic, chlorothaladone was much more likely to cause these changes in serum creatinine. At four weeks, EGFR was lower in chlorothaladone group by 2.7 mls per minute. It remained lower by 2.2 mls per minute at 12 weeks. However, after stopping the drug, it returned to baseline. We evaluated the risk of kidney failure or death. There were 29 events in the placebo group and 20 in the chlorothaladone group. The hazard ratio was 0.63 with the upper bound of confidence interval at 1.12. In conclusion, in stage 4 CKD, chlorothaladone effectively reduces systolic blood pressure about 10 millimeters mercury within four weeks, which persists at 12 weeks. Reduction in USCR by 50% suggests kidney protection. The blood pressure and volume contraction effects of chlorothaladone are long-acting. Changes in EGFR are often seen more likely to occur among patients on loop diuretics but do not appear to harm kidney function in the long term. Blood pressure, electrolytes, and kidney function should be closely monitored when using chlorothaladone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raji. Very, uh, uh, first of all, it's a very interesting presentation. And uh, I think it's a, it's kind of a, it's a good idea to pre-record it, really. I, I always was not sure how the pre-recorded things will go. But I think when it is pre-recorded, uh, there is so much of focus. And uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, really. Maybe um, organizers should think about it. In the, in the future, uh, this kind of a pre-recorded, very focused, very timed, and very, very nice. Thank you very much for uh, showing the data that uh, are ob obviously the latest in terms of uh, your long pining work in hypertension and CKD for so many decades. And of course, this paper uh, appropriately was uh, published in the best forum in medical literature, New England Journal of Medicine. So congratulations uh, for that uh, work, which uh, was uh, obviously uh, accepted by the reviewers of New England Journal of Medicine. Great, I I'm very happy about it. Uh, now, uh, what I will do, uh, actually what I wanted to do, a good part of it has been covered as it happens in programs of this nature, when so many learned people are there. I'll give a very encapsulated overview of uh, what I know of this compound uh, for a number of years. Uh, my, uh, my introduction to diuretic therapy, Rajiv, was actually in Dallas when I, when I came here. And at that time, Dr. Kaplan was very puzzled why people use uh, furosemide, Lasix, for hypertension in patients with no CKD in the emergency room, hypertension, Lasix, which uh, without heart failure. And then he thought that th there's so much a confusion uh, within Lasix and chlorotaladone and hydrochlorothiazide. Why not we do 
a comparative study, not an outcome study, but a comparative study, uh, furosemide, chlorothaladone, hydrochlorothiazide, let them randomize and let us look at the blood pressure response to these diuretics that were commonly being used at that time at Parkland Hospital. Uh, that's how my introduction was to this drug. And my other introduction was, uh, maybe France will remember, Rajiv, you may not know, there was a very good researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles, Mohinder Sambi, S-A-M-B-H-I, uh, renin angiotensin in person. And that at one conference, it's quite senior to me, at one conference, he met me and he told me, Dr. Ram, this is a book I want you to read. And then we'll chat over the phone. And the, and the book, the title of the book was Chlorthalidone. And uh, it was a very basic chemistry book, very interesting book written by Dr. Sambi, who is no longer, of course, uh, is deceased at the present time. That is my kind of historical connection with this particular approach to treatment of hypertension. So let me go over now. Uh, uh, let me see, is it allowing me to share? Okay, I'll share the screen. Yes, Okay. Can you all see the slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, these are uh, uh, some almost all these studies have been covered already that have used uh, diuretic therapy using chlorothaladone as a molecule uh, in these studies, starting with Tomes, Mr. Fit, HTFP, Shep, Shep Extents, and all had. And of course, more recently, Sprint also. I'll cover some of these. And this one you have already seen from Dr. Meserly, but this is put in a different way, that uh, comparison, in comparison to no treatment, chlorothaladone-based therapy was shown for the first time at that time of reducing the incidence of stroke by a large percentage in the systolic hypertension in the elderly program, which was a very ambitious program looking at blood pressure reduction in the elderly. Then, as you have seen from Dr. Meserly, the study was extended for 22 years. I, I can't imagine being pe people being followed for 22 years, but uh, other than, of course, uh, Framingham. Uh, and again, 22-year follow-up showed that chlorothaladone-based therapy in the elderly was associated with significant reduction in risk of all known complications attributable to high blood pressure. And this is something that uh, Dr. Lucher has already shown, but I'm showing it uh, from the, these are the all hat uh, original uh, slide kit they gave to the investigators. And you'll see that chlorothaladone based therapy was uh, associated with a significant decrease in heart failure compared to other two drugs. Of course, I am not going to show doxazosin. And now the question always comes up, is since diuretics might cause uh, metabolic aberrations, uh, particularly in uh, glucose, the question was, uh, uh, what was the outcome in diabetic and non-diabetic patients in all had? You will notice, despite the presence of di diabetes, chlorothaladone-based therapy provided the same protection as non-diabetics, suggesting the metabolic consequences of uh, diuretics are overcome by the beneficial effect on the blood pressure. So the metabolic aberrations could occur, but they, they appear to be neutralized or offset by overall hemodynamic effect that is shown in this particular trial. Uh, hypertension detection follow-up program is actually one of the earlier studies in 70s than which has shown that in patients at that time, moderate hypertension uh, compared to placebo uh, was associated with significant decrease in mortality. Uh, this was a study that was done in mid 70s and published in 17 and 80. Uh, Mr. Fit trial, you have already heard a couple of times, but this is one of the larger trials in hypertension because it was done for seven years. And the conclusion of the Mr. Fit trial was greater blood pressure reduction was seen with chlorothaladone than hydrochlorothiazide because it was a crossover trial. And these are the data from Mr. Fit trial, uh, actually analyzed by Dr. Ernst, but the principal investigator who passed away recently, Dr. Stamler. And he showed that both chlorothaladone and hydrochlorothiazide 
reduce the blood pressure, but the magnitude of fall in blood pressure was more with chlorothaladone compared to hydrochlorothiazide. Consequently, a reduction in the left ventricular mass was also uh, more with uh, chlorothaladone. So greater the fall in blood pressure, greater is the regression of left ventricular hypertrophy as shown in uh, Mr. Pitt uh, trial. And uh, this is a mapping of uh, potassium during the seven year study. Uh, very few studies really have studied potassium for an extended period of time. And when they looked at the potassium over a seven year period, there was no major difference between hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothaladone. There were minor differences, but not statistically significant. Now, about four years ago, I contacted one of the investigators of Mr. Fit, Dr. James Neeson, and I spoke to him about it, whether he had any more data. And this is the communication he sent to me. He, he's one of the uh, PIs of Mr. Fit. He said, we followed the patients with Mr. Fit closely. There were no major differences in the potassium levels between hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothaladone per one of the important investigators of Mr. Fit, who is still around, he's retired, but he's still around. Now, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine uh, published uh, this particular study uh, where there was an analysis of electrolyte disturbances in patients taking diuretic 30,000 patients. And the conclusion was neither hypokalemia or hyponatremia were more common with chlorothaladone compared to hydrochlorothiazide key at equivalent doses. 30,000 patients uh, is, a, is, a, is a large uh, data set. Uh, Dr. Richard Grimm, uh, who uh, is still around, retired, he was the architect of Tome's study, and he at that time showed that chlorothaladone-based therapy, uh, fall in blood pressure was very, very similar to amlodipine. Of course, this kind of a study was duplicated by Dr. Farik and co-workers later on with low-dose uh, chlorothaladone. This is a study I mentioned to you that uh, myself and Dr. Kaplan did in 70s, where we looked at the blood pressure response to hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothaladone, and also loop diuretics. I'm not showing loop diuretics, but we, we thought uh, this study was published in Archives of Internal Medicine that chlorothaladone-based therapy caused a little bit two to three millimeter more reduction in blood pressure compared to hydrochlorothiazide. And uh, there are a number of meta-analysis uh, that are uh, available uh, for your review, comparing chlorothaladone to hydrochlorothiazide equivalent doses in terms of uh, outcomes. And when you look at uh, outcomes, they favor more towards benefit with chlorothaladone. Nothing wrong with hydrochlorothiazide, but more benefit with chlorothaladone. And uh, these are the most recent uh, global uh, recommendations for diuretic therapy uh, for hypertension. American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. For the first time, they have differentiated between chlorothaladone and other diuretics. And uh, European Society of Cardiology, European Society of Hypertension, have uh, also separated a chlorothaladone <clears throat> from hydrochlorothiazide. And the International Society of Hypertension, which is a very, very conservative uh, society, and they're very, very careful. Uh, in fact, they're a little bit timid, uh, not careful. Uh, they suggested uh, very interestingly, hydrochlorothiazide should be used only when chlorothaladone is not available. Very, very interesting statement uh, that they have made. Now, uh, Dr. Barry Carter, whose data you have seen, he put this graph comparing the usual dose of hydrochlorothiazide and low dose of chlorothaladone. What he has shown is the usual <clears throat> dose of hydrochlorothiazide fall in blood pressure. You can achieve it <clears throat> by a low dose of <clears throat> chlorothaladone. <clears throat> very, very, <clears throat> Very interesting data. <clears throat> this is something that uh, <clears throat> Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Meserly has already shown that uh, his data from <clears throat> the Journal of American College of Cardiology showing that uh, chlorothaladone low dose 
uh, was quite significant reduction in blood pressure <clears throat> compared to the usual dose of hydrochlorothiazide and uh, again confirming the usefulness of low dose chlorothaladone. This is a, a communication that was sent to me by Dr. Paul Welton. And uh, what Paul Welton wrote to me was, if chlorothaladone 6.25 milligram is effective in lowering the blood pressure, there's no reason not to apply low dose in clinical practice. Because I asked him that uh, many of the recommendations are 12.525. What does he think of chlorothaladone? And this is the response he, he, he gave that there is no reason not to apply the low dose therapy in clinical practice. Uh, obviously, you know, he's a, he's a guidelines guru. Then lastly, ladies and gentlemen, about the SPRINT trial. In the SPRINT trial, uh, the people who were treated uh, aggressively towards systolic blood pressure, a majority of them uh, were given a thiazide type diuretic, uh, chlorothaladone, along with other uh, antihypertensive drugs because it's combination therapy. And what they have shown is that, uh, again, in patients with diabetes, the patients who were aggressively treated to lower levels of blood pressure, systolic 120, uh, despite the presence of diabetes, they had a very favorable outcome, suggesting that diuretic therapy, uh, although it might cause some aberrations in glucose levels, it did not uh, negate the therapeutic benefit. Even in the SPRINT trial, patients with diabetes did quite well with diuretic therapy with blood pressures up to 120 systolic, even in the elderly. And this is something that you have already seen from ship extension. I'm going to uh, uh, skip it. Now, two trials I'm going to show uh, recently published. Uh, this is a trial on prevention of hypertension, very similar to uh, the trophy trial that was done with ARB, Candesartan, uh, on prevention of uh, hypertension in patients with prehypertension. This is a study done in South America by Fuchs and co-workers in 21 medical centers in Brazil, where they took patients with prehypertension and exposed them either to placebo or chlorothaladone, and they followed them for about 18 months. Those patients who were on chlorothaladone, they had a lesser uh, chance of developing new hypertension compared to placebo. And uh, their conclusion was uh, treatment with chlorothaladone prevented uh, prehypertension from converting into hypertension in contradistinction to placebo, where they uh, went on to develop regular or sustained hypertension. And when they looked at left ventricular mass, uh, they also noted uh, treatment with chlorothaladone in prehypertension caused a reduction of left ventricular mass, whereas there was no change in left ventricular mass in patients on placebo, which is all what you would expect this is due to all fall in blood pressure. And now uh, this is a study done in India where they used a combination of telmisartan hydrochlorothiazide or telmisartan chlorothaladone in patients with primary hypertension. Those patients who took telmisartan with chlorothaladone in comparison to hydrochlorothiazide had a greater reduction in blood pressure uh, uh, during a short, just one month study. Now, uh, one of the things that is a very hot topic in uh, medical management of resistant hypertension is uh, what diuretic to use. Uh, some people say furosemide, some people will say other uh, loop diuretics, but this is a study that was done by Postland co-workers where they converted patients on resistant hypertension from hydrochlorothiazide to chlorothaladone. And with that conversion, there was a fall in blood pressure so their conclusion was in resistant hypertension, one option would be perhaps to convert the nature of the diuretic and see if the blood pressure responds after switching to a chlorothaladone therapy. And this is a, a triple drug combination therapy done in Sri Lanka, and it was uh, sponsored by the George Institute of Public Health, which does a lot of global studies. And they had uh, 700 patients from Sri Lanka who received either the usual core care or fixed dose combination 
uh, telmisartan, amlodipine, clothalidone, and when they received fixed dose combination, the fall in blood pressure was much more than uh, usual care. And this is the target blood pressure, the patients who on fixed dose combination of telmisartan, amlodipine, clothalidone, they had a higher percentage of achieving uh, goal blood pressure compared to those who are uh, on usual care. So the conclusion of this paper in JAMA was use of such fixed dose combination as initial therapy uh, may be an effective way to improve blood pressure control, especially in South Asia. Uh, this was already mentioned by Dr. Miserly about the duration of action between hydrochlorothiazine and hydrochlorothalidone. Looks like the nocturnal blood pressure, which is very important. And actually, Dr. Dr. Agarwal, I feel a little bit embarrassed talking about nocturnal hypertension in front of Dr. Agarwal. He's a pioneer on uh, circadian uh, pathophysiology of blood pressure control, especially in patients with CKD. And in this particular study, the nighttime blood pressure was lowered more with chlorothalidone compared to hydrochlorothiazide. And these are, by the way, these are equivalent doses. So that could be one another hemodynamic uh, difference between the two diuretics. Lastly, uh, this always comes up with statins, this comes with beta blockers, this comes with CCBs, is whether there is something besides the pharmacological effect. A number of pleiotropic effects have been proposed with uh, chlorotalidone. None of them have been substantially proved, but these are of academic interest uh, to most of us. One is whether uh, chlorotalidone uh, improves the coagulation profile, and this is in comparison to hydrochlorothiazide and propranolol, chlorotalidone uh, causes less platelet aggregation. So it may have an antiplatelet effect in vitro. Uh, whether this happens in people, we do not know. But certainly the platelet aggregation appears to be significantly decreased in the presence of chlorotalidone compared to a beta blocker or hydrochlorothiazide. The clinical correlate has not been done. And the another thing is nitric oxide, uh, as uh, some of the nephrologists, uh, both in the faculty and the audience will know, hormonic anhydrase inhibition in the kidney has been shown to increase the activity of nitric oxide. And in this particular study, comparing uh, the carbonic anhydrase activity, there was a reduction with chlorotalidone. Of course, the best reduction you, all, you always see it with uh, acetazolamide, uh, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, but chlorotalidone also inhibited uh, carbonic anhydrase, which may increase the availability of nitric oxide in vitro study. And uh, lastly, a very small study looking at uh, arterial elasticity, or you want to pulse, pulse wave velocity, doesn't matter. Uh, the pulse wave velocity, which if it is very faster, that could have an adverse hemodynamic effect. And in this comparative study, small study, looking at chlorotalidone and hydrochlorothiazide, there was a greater reduction in pulse wave velocity compared to hydrochlorothiazide, suggesting that there could be an effect on central hemodynamics uh, over and beyond peripheral blood pressure, because reducing pulse wave velocity improves cardiac fraction uh, and cardiac function. So let me conclude uh, my fellow panelists, my fellow faculty members, and all the audience. Uh, I want to bring two, three quotations from uh, leaders who worked in this area. Dr. Dominic Sika, who is, uh, of course, well known to all the nephrologists. Uh, he mentioned uh, in 2006, when he was the president of the American Society of Hypertension. Chlorotalidone has it always been the best uh, thiazide thi diuretic. Uh, and uh, we now, the definition of blood pressure, uh, at least I subscribe to this uh, new normal blood pressure. To me, it is not controversial. That is the blood pressure that you should achieve for. So let me, let me go quickly. Uh, the most important thing that we do uh, is uh, measure the blood pressure in clinical practice. If you don't measure it properly, then you underdiagnose or you overdiagnose uh, hypertension, and that is not the way to do it. Uh, you have to always measure the blood pressure properly. 
So let me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me conclude. I know that I, I took through a very uh, fast journey of flow talent and development from uh, 70s to ending with spring, looking at the hemodynamic data, looking at the electrolyte data, looking at central hemodynamics outside uh, and outcome data and dose equivalency as much as possible. And so that we apply the current knowledge advances to the ultimate benefits of patients with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, so that we are choosing the right drug in the right dosage for the right outcome in the right patient and for the rightful longevity of our community. With those remarks, uh, I'll conclude uh, CK and then we can, uh, uh, I think now uh, experts will comment uh, one by one for a brief period of time and then we'll have a discussion period. CK, you want to start commenting, then you can yeah. ask uh, Samir and then uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Kher and Dr. Narsimhan, any order that you like. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ram. It was a wonderful uh, review, uh, a, a complete uh, review from the history uh, of beginning of chlorothyridone till the latest of the data uh, in the sprint. So uh, now I think we, we uh, uh, keep it open for discussion. Uh, let me uh, uh, let me begin with uh, Dr. Lusher. Is he there? Yes, I'm uh, here. Yes, yeah. hello. Hi, hi. Uh, uh, sir, in your in your talk, you talk about uh, uh, I being a cardiologist. Uh, it, I you spoke about hep rep mid range ejection fraction and the preserved ejection fraction. Uh, it, the, the hypertension as the most important comorbidity that leads to heart failure in, in later on in life. I think it, it is worthwhile to choose a drug, definitely worthwhile to choose a drug which will prevent um, heart failure, whether hep rep or hep rep, doesn't matter. But as long as it prevents heart failure, uh, we, are, we are good with that drug. So in that matter, uh, what is your verdict from your talk that uh, uh, whether chlorothyridone will be a superior take, superior choice, as compared to other um, uh, other diuretics in the management of uncomplicated hypertension for prevention of heart failure? Well, um, of course, the, the data of uh, comparative data with other diuretics is uh, not so extensive like, uh, you know, the comparison uh, to uh, amlodipine uh, as an example or the doxazosine in, in the ALHAT trial. But um, we, had, uh, we have two different uh, meta-analysis and uh, systematic reviews. And one uh, that was published in Hypertension, as I showed, uh, there was a clear advantage of chlorotalidone. And I, I think Franz Messerschmitt's uh, nice trial uh, with uh, uh, um, ambulatory blood pressure would be even more convincing. Uh, in this regard, of course, this was only a short time uh, trial with no endpoint on heart failure. But I, I would guess that uh, anything that lowers blood pressure more consistently and over the 24 hour period should be uh, advantageous in preventing uh, heart failure, be it half PEF and half REF. And in fact, half PEF, uh, that's really in the center of interest now in many uh, heart failure groups uh, is probably even more closely linked uh, to uh, 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 hypertension than have ref where of course coronary disease as such uh, is a very very important uh, and genetic uh, uh, alterations very important causes so i think uh, uh, looking at the overall incidence i, I would say that uh, chlorotalidone uh, would be pref my preferred choice unfortunately it's not available in every country, but India is, of course, in a good position, as I hear. Yes, yes, surely. CK, CK yes. Can, I, can I suggest, uh, if you don't mind, yes. uh, if doctor, uh, from neurology point of view, if Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan can give his expert comment, yes. and nephrology point of view, Dr. Vijay K can give the expert comments. Absolutely. And if Samir is available, his expert comments, and then we'll have interaction with the speakers and uh, the audience. So uh, you can ask uh, maybe Lakshmi Narsimhan to yes, comment yes, and then Vijay Kher. Yeah. So, so, so one, one quick thought and question to Professor Lusher. 
uh, in congestive cardiac failure, as far as uh, neurologists are concerned, I, 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 Dr. Professor Louis Kaplan introduced a term called cardiac encephalopathy, where cardiac encephalopathy is because of the, the congestive cardiac failure, where back pressure results in accumulation of fluid, and essentially with the treatment is carbonic anhydrase. And my a quick thought went through my mind that this is, since this being a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, I thought we normally what we do in cardiac encephalopathy is we let out let out repeated lumbar therapeutic lumbar punctures. So I thought this uh, in a congestive cardiac failure, as even if it's a prophylactic to prevent cardiac encephalopathy, this is going to be an additional benefit which we are going to get out of this molecule because it is. It will reduce it. This was one of, one of my comments and a wonderful talk. Thanks for you. And uh, my second uh, quick comment to, it, to Professor uh, Mizzell is uh, one of the excellent talk. And uh, I really enjoyed every word of it. And uh, do you know, sir, in the, in the primary prevention of stroke, is there any other drug which has higher percentage than this for prevention of stroke, primary prevention of stroke, and also for secondary prevention? Do you have... Even I don't think the percentage which is shown in the chef is around 36. It's a, it's a very, very good uh, uh, result. And uh, even the clopidogrel doesn't have that. Your comments on that, sir? Well, there's no question that uh, clotalidone is excellent in, in preventing strokes. Uh, when you look at all that, amlodipine is just about as good. And I think that that's about the best evidence we have that actually CCBs or specifically amlodipine is, you know, very potent in doing so as well. And then we go to the as a second second class, so to speak, are the ARBs, uh, and even less good are the ACE inhibitors and, and the beta blockers. Thank you. And uh, as Professor Venkatram said that. I think this is the uh, highest linear relationship than any other organ in reducing the, uh, the stroke in, in, in the efficiency of stroke prevention. And I think uh, it is going to, have a, going to be there for long and uh, reign over the uh, therapy in, among the neurologists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Narasimhan, for your wonderful comment. Vijay, my good friend Vijay K. Yes, uh, Rajiv, uh, as usual, you gave an excellent talk and I've heard him before many, many times. And as you said that he is a world leader as far as hypertension and chronic kidney diseases concerned, brought tremendous number of studies that he has done. And Rajiv, I have one question. In patients who are say stage two, stage three kidney disease, would you suggest using say starting with a 6.25 milligrams of clothalidone along with other hypertensives, antihypertensives, because many of, most of our patients require two or three drugs, as you also showed in your study that the mean uh, number of drugs was about 3.2 or so in your study as well. So uh, would you consider starting with a smaller dose and then as the stage increases over the years, uh, increasing the dose or you would you would think that uh, that may not be necessary. Rajiv. Rajiv, could you hear this? Rajiv, I don't. Yes, I, I can hear you. I was muted. Yeah. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Now. Okay. Okay, Rajiv. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I, uh, I believe your uh, comments are very wise. Every drug is a poison and we have to use the minimum dose of the drug uh, to enable a therapeutic response while minimizing its toxicity. And you know, you saw a 30,000 uh, patient study and what it says, uh, the electrolyte abnormalities uh, with hydrochlorothiazide are similar with chlorothalidone. But there was a catchphrase there, in equivalent doses. So what is the equivalent dose of chlorothalidone and hydrochlorothiazide? It's actually three to one. If you use uh, 12 and a half of uh, hydrochlorothiazide, so it's equivalent to uh, 12 and a half of chlorothalidone, it's about 37.5 of hydrochlorothiazide. Most of us believe it's two to one, but actually there's a meta-analysis that was done that shows it's a three to one ratio. 
So lowest dose is best. In fact, even in stage four kidney disease, after doing the click trial, I don't start with 12.5. I start with 6.25, particularly if the patients are on loop diuretics. In in United States, we don't have uh, less than 25 available. So I tell the patients take 12.5 milligrams three times a week. And that seems uh, to work pretty good. So if your patient is on a loop diuretic, definitely opt for, opt for 6.25. But if your patient is not, you can use 12.5, but I think it's wise to use 6.25 as a starting dose. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed your talk as Thank usual. You. You know, one comment I would make uh, in the context of using chlorothaladone in India, uh, in the summer months, uh, the heat is quite high and diuretics, especially when you're using in combination with ACE and ARBs, uh, can actually be very potent. And in the context of uh, the concurrent illnesses, you have to be very cautious when you're combining a ARB with a diuretic. Uh, you know, I was visiting India uh, a few years back, and a cousin of mine uh, suddenly passed out uh, at his home. And his wife started yelling, he's passed out. And what was he on? He was on tell me certain diuretic combination, and he was having diarrhea. And, you know, you get volume depleted, you take a combination, potent combination of drugs. And the doctor has told you to keep taking these drugs, and he got lightheaded, he passed out. So it's very important to tell the patients, look, if you get sick, it's uh, okay to stop this for a few days till you recover, because otherwise you can get into problems with these drugs, particularly in the summer months. Yes, I think, uh, Rajiv, you made a very, very valid point. We usually tell our patients that their blood pressure medicines and usually the number of drugs goes down. The diuretics obviously go down in summer months. And in winter months, the blood pressure tends to go up and then the num number of drugs might have to be added. Even the dietary changes which occur with the season itself uh, also make uh, yeah. value for that kind of thing. And usually you have to increase the number of drugs for control of blood pressure during the winter months in comparison to summer months. And uh, sick day rules, especially when they are in combination with either a loop diuretic and along with the AS and ARBs is very, very valid point. Very, very important. Thank you, Vijay. Is, uh, is Samir Dhani around? Yes or no? Uh, if, if he is not around, Can't see. I know we, we are uh, pushing against the time, but uh, there are a number of questions, and this is like a kaleidoscope. And uh, we will quickly go through it. I will comment. Uh, if somebody disagrees, uh, you must disagree uh, because I am seeing the trail of uh, questions. Very, as always, very thoughtful questions, uh, hoping that there will be a thoughtful answer. Uh, Ramesh Dargad, uh, there is a high incidence of hyponatremia in the elderly patients. I, I presume hyponatremia from the diuretic. Anybody has a quick comment, uh, raise your hand. If not, I will give a comment. No, okay. Uh, it, yeah, we always worry about uh, hyponatremia. Hypo in an elderly patient, you worry about any disturbance that occurs. Uh, hyponatremia can happen more in the elderly than in the other age group because there is an old pathophysiological principle for every degree of volume reduction, there is a greater increase in antidiuretic hormone in the elderly. So for any degree of volume depletion, there is a brisk release of antidiuretic hormone that can cause hyponatremia to a greater extent. The other thing is a uh, lot of compulsive water drinking. I'm not saying psychogenic water drinking, but there's a lot of water drinking due to the bottled water now in the last 20 years. Everybody has bottled water here, here, back pocket, front pocket. Somebody has told them it is it prevents kidney stones, and somebody told them that it prevents constipation, and somebody told them it is good for health. So what they're doing is 
they're watching all these things. So that could be, I'm not saying it does not cause, but when you see hyponatremia, don't jump, it could be from the diuretic. Uh, I don't want to go to pathology of hyponatremia because there are three types of hyponatremia, but there could be other causes of hyponatremia in a patient with diuretic. Uh, experts, uh, anything further? So Dr. Dr. Ram, very good explanation. Just uh, to add a couple of things. You typically see it in elderly, uh, frail women who are not eating very much. So when your dietary intake is poor, especially when you're on a sodium restricted diet, your hyponatremia is more likely to occur. Uh, second, uh, underlying liver disease, and especially in alcoholics, if you are drinking a lot of beer, for instance, and you're taking <laughs> hype, uh, you know, uh, this drug, uh, then you're playing with fire because it's uh, re reducing the ability of the kidney to get rid of free water. Thank you. You know, uh, pandemic going on to some extent, Ukraine war, then <laughs> gasoline prices, <laughs> transportation problems. No, the reason is all these problems going on but this Dr. Kumar has an important question, despite all these things, erectile dysfunction. Forget about Ukraine war, forget about pandemic. I want to know whether CTD causes erectile dysfunction. Who is going to volunteer an answer? I think France is ready to volunteer. Sure. I'll be happy to answer. The oh, I'm happy to is... already given his uh, answer. <laughs> There are three mechanisms by which anti three principal mechanisms by which antihypertensives can lower, can uh, decrease erectile function. Number one is lower your blood pressure per se. Number two is volume depletion, and number three is interfering with the sympathetic nervous system. Now, all drugs that acutely lower blood pressure, you need a certain pressure in your system to get an erection. So, acute lowering of blood pressure can actually decrease erectile function, but normally the patient recovers within a few days um, without any problem. Volume depletion, the same. Now, I wanna make it very clear, all diuretics initially cause volume depletion, but actually with costalidone and other thiazide diuretics, after about 10 days to two weeks, the plasma volume returns to pre-treatment level. So volume depletion is no longer an issue. Sympathetic dysfunction that occurs with the beta blocker and is actually persistent. So these are the three mechanisms and clotalidone should really not be a major issue here with regard to erectile dysfunction. Thank you. So what you're saying is stroke prevention is a little bit is better than worrying about other uh, social aspects of life. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this next question is important question. I have been begging both in US as well as in India to somebody to do a study uh, of clotalidone on central hemodynamics. Uh, Anil, I spoke to you also many times. Uh, this is a question from Vahida Hassan. Uh, why the drug has not been subjected to the new hemodynamic parameters such as central hemodynamics, uh, central aortic BP. I show you pulse velocity. Uh, I guess it has to be done. I don't know if anybody has interest in doing these things anymore. Anybody wants to comment? No? Okay. Then, uh, oh, this is, uh, we have uh, Vijay, we have uh, Rajiv Agarwal. What is the mechanism of reduction in albumin? from Dr. Well, B.K. Sinha, mechanism of reduction of albumin, I, I presume with the diuretics. Well, um, there was a very large reduction that we saw uh, in the CLIC trial. There was actually a 50% reduction. Um, the, uh, by comparison, if you look at SGLT2 inhibitors or non-steroidal MRA, at three to four months, you only get about a 30% reduction mean. This is showing a 50% reduction. Now, both those drugs were on top of ACE and ARB, and so was in CLIC trial. Patients had to be on ACE or ARB or a beta blocker. So when you are, there are studies that have been done in nephrology that if you use a diuretic on a background of an ACE or ARB, it actually enhances the anti-albuminuric effects of those drugs as well. 
Uh, blood pressure is part of it, but it also could be an improvement in intraglomerular uh, pressure uh, that, that is mediating the effect. The amazing part is that two weeks after stopping chlorothaladone, the anti-albuminuric effects persist, uh, which suggests that there might be metabolites of uh, chlorothaladone are very long acting, and perhaps they are uh, persisting and causing a persistent reduction in albuminuria. Thank you. Uh, Vijay, you have any, anything to add? No, no, no. I think Rajiv has uh, explained it so well. Okay. Nothing now, to add. Now, the next question, uh, which has been uh, discussed already by the, uh, the legend trial uh, of uh, hydrochlorothiazide, how they compared, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a statistical uh, method uh, uh, greedy nearest neighbor algorithm. People who do studies, greedy nearest neighbor algorithm, it has always has to be balanced properly if you want to interpret. So you should have equal number of patients, hopefully well matched. And if you apply this algorithm, then actually that particular trial, uh, which has shown only 30,000 patients on uh, chlorothaladone, 670,000 patients, anil or so on hydrochlorothiazide. So if you apply this uh, greedy nearest neighbor algorithm, uh, you, you actually see fewer events with uh, chlorothaladone. So that, that could be one explanation, but obviously we, all of us have to monitor the data and uh, look at scientific advances and come to your own conclusions. I think the pleiotropic effects I've mentioned to you only out of interest, uh, uh, hyponatremia, oh, uh, is hyponatremia from chlorothaladone a greater concern in patients with uh, CKD from Dr. Uh, Avula Srinivas from, uh, from Telugu states. I'm from Telugu states. So is that a greater concern in patients with CKD in comparison to patients who don't have CKD? Well, you know, in a patient who has CKD, uh, the homeostatic mechanisms are impaired. So the window uh, uh, at, uh, for which you can compensate your serum osmolality in uh, any patient who has CKD is limited. Okay. So definitely hyponatremia would be a greater concern for a patient with CKD, particularly if you're using higher doses of chlorothaladone and particularly if you're also using loop diuretics on top. So it's a dangerous drug. It's an old drug, but don't get complacent by using it. Say, oh, I'm using just 6.25. It will do nothing. It, in a predisposed patient, you can do substantial damage. It's a balance between efficacy and safety and just be careful using this drug. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, your question of a combination of the drugs has been just addressed by Dr. Rajiv Agarwal. And of course, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a perennial evergreen question with the diuretics, <laughs> hyperuricemia. Uh, people have to ask about hyperuricemia, hypercalcemia, uh, uric acid goes up, but that's not a reason unless somebody has recurrent tophaceous gout or CKD with gout or uh, uh, deforming gout. Uh, any, anybody has comment on uh, uric acid as a monitor for therapy? Uh, Vijay or uh, Rajiv or anybody else? Tom yeah. or Franz? Well, Franz, uh, Franz you, uh, you published on uh, uric acid as a risk factor. And uh, so is this, uh, is this a bad thing uh, when we look at outcomes with diuretics? Uh, it's a tough question to answer. Um, if it is a risk factor, it's, it's, it's not a powerful risk factor for sure. Um, it's more of concern in that it can precipitate a gout attack. That can happen. Oh. Um, if, if you use a uh, you know, particular high dose of, of a thiazide diuretic, chlorothalidone and apamide or hydrochlorothiazide, you can precipitate a gout attack. And I think that's the major concern. But a slight increase in uric acid, um, it's the same as when Kana has shown with diabetes. I think the overall reduction in the rate of, uh, in the risk of stroke, heart attack, and uh, heart failure and sudden death 
uh, greatly outweighs the small risk of increased uric acid. I have also a question to you, Franz. Uh, why is it that ACE inhibitors are less effective than chlorothalidone and amlodipine in preventing stroke? Is this just blood pressure? Because amlodipine is probably a bit more potent as a blood pressure lowering drug and maybe chlorothalidone as well? Actually, it's a very simple answer, Tom. When you look at the old hat study, and I can send you the paper, and uh, you look at blood pressure variability, chlorothalidone and amlodipine lower blood pressure, visit to visit blood pressure consistently, very nicely. When you look at lisinopril, it's up and yeah. down, up and down, up and down. So I think the whole difference difference with lisinopril is based on the simple fact that it was given once a day and yeah. you know there's some uh, less compliance uh, less duration of action i think that's the main reason there so yeah. i have a little bit of a different take on it i i think that the uh, these uh, the explanation is probably a lot simpler in the all had trial they never allowed patients with lisinopril to be on a diuretic which is totally an artificial trial. Yeah. And they never adjusted the analyses for the blood pressure. And if you look at the blood pressures in the lisinopril group compared to chlorothalidone, it's always three millimeters higher, no matter when you look. So if you have a higher blood pressure with lisinopril, you're not using a diuretic, like you pointed out, Hill saying, you know, clinical trials are clinical trials, but all that was not clinical practice. It was an artificial study comparing four different agents. So I think that it was all blood pressure because they never adjusted the stroke risk for the blood pressure. Very yeah. good point, Rajiv. And actually even more important, or, or at least as important, the second drug added was a tenolol. Come on, nobody in his yes. right mind would use such a combination these Exactly. Days, right? it, it'll favor yeah. chlorothalidone and it'll yeah. disadvantage lisinopril. Yeah. Who does that in clinical practice? Right. Okay. I think both yeah. are right. Both are right. I mean, amlodipine has 36 hours half-life and, uh, and of course, chlorothalidone, as you showed, France in your trial, probably 24 hours. So that's that's one factor, but blood pressure is the other, and it's well, interesting. You know, uh, yeah, uh, Candice Sarton has a four-hour half-life, and its blood pressure control is twenty-four hours. So the pharmacodynamics can be quite different. I mean, with chlorothalidone sticks to the RBCs last weeks. So I think that when I look at this, the trial design of all hat and look at the interpretation, I says, yeah, you're sort of doing a very artificial physiology study in a very large population, which is not reflective of practice, what we do every day. That is that just I, shows I, the difficulty I, to do trials, uh, uh, you know, yeah. reflecting practice, very yeah. difficult. I, I agree, but I just want to add one thing. I think uh, this, I, I have a feeling that it is far more than just a BP control because of its uh, pleiotropic actions. The, even though we are not too sure of the multiple uh, axes in which it acts, it, I think it has, even, even if you look at that, uh, uh, the click trials, the albumin takes such a long time to reach the, the, the effect was so long. We, didn't, we really don't know what is a, uh, what exactly is the reason for it. So like that, we have a lot of unsolved areas where and it might, might take this, it is beyond the BP control, chlorothaldone has a preventive effect on stroke. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, it's quite late in India, and uh, I mentioned to you there's so many questions, and we'll we'll have to put an end, otherwise uh, people might develop uh, nocturnal. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't say, I, want to I say just, yeah. nocturnal, whatever it is. But in all fairness, uh, Vidya Sindhu Sejao has given a very big narrative. It cannot be. Everything has been written. Uh, comparison with indapamide, there are no head-to-head -head comparisons with indapamide uh, and other diuretics, but I agree it has to be done, but I also know that nobody will do it. Uh, now, the drug of choice for isolated systolic hypertension, uh, according to guidelines, SEC beer or diuretic, and you can add anything else. There is no drug that does not lower the systolic blood pressure to my thing, but these are 
based upon the trials. And then, oh, let's not go into renal denervation therapy, please, for, the, for today's session. Uh, that, that is a different story altogether. Let's not go into sleep apnea either. That's a different story. Let's not go into renal artery stenosis. Also, let's not go in. Maybe, maybe Tom Lucher, it's okay. Multi-chamber pacing for resistant heart failure. Uh, you, I, I mean, resistant heart failure, they're hopefully they're in the transplant list, but uh, multi-chamber uh, well, pacing. I mean, you know, cardiac resynchronization therapy is an established treatment in patients that are having a, uh, a QRS complex of more than 130 milliseconds and have symptoms in spite of optimal medical therapy. That's what the guidelines say, and uh, it's very effective for uh, quality of life and also outcomes. And uh, again, I don't know why libitalol is not popular, uh, although it's an alpha and beta blocker. The only thing that I know is that if you give intravenously, the alpha to beta blocking ratio is seven to one. But if you get orally, the alpha to beta blocking ratio is the reverse. It mostly acts like a beta blocker, not as an alpha blocker. Unless you go to 800, 1200 milligram, where it causes postural hypotension, then you know it is working as an alpha blocker. But in the usual doses, 200, 400 milligram, it is a beta blocker with very little of alpha blocking property due to its metabolism in the liver. Why is it not popular? I don't know why is it not popular, but uh, it's, uh, it's not widely used. It's not a bad drug, but it's mostly a beta blocker when taken. The more. Anybody differs, and then we are coming in another five minutes, we'll conclude. Anybody differs on this? Uh, for Anil Parikh, uh, yeah. pharmacologist par excellence. <laughs> no, no, sir. I don't, I'm not differing on this, but I would like to take an opportunity to ask one question to Dr. Rajiv. And that question is that in the click study, 12.5 uh, gave most of the blood pressure and there was no additional lowering by increasing to 25. While in the shape and all head, without renal insufficiency much, there is a substantial reduction in blood pressure in people when you uh, go from 12.5 to 25. How do you explain this uh, renal insufficiency, not having much uh, advanced CKD and not much uh, uh, lowering of BP when you increase the dose to 12.5 to 25? Well, um, that's a great question. I think that uh, one of the one of the caveats in our study was that everybody was on a, a RAS inhibition therapy, right? So you are either on a ACE ARB or a beta blocker. When you add a little bit of a diuretic on top of that, you will have a potentiated effect of those drugs. Um, number two, our protocol specified that if at 12.5, your home blood pressure was not controlled, you would up titrate the therapy. And we did up titrate the therapy in most patients, they went to 25. Now, the additional reduction could be because those people went to 25. It's very hard. You're not testing out uh, in a parallel group, 12.5, 25, 50. That would be the ideal uh, way to test in a clinical trial, which one is the best dose. We didn't do that. So this becomes a conditional probability. And you cannot discount the fact that there are patient-specific factors that lead to an increase in dose. By what that means is that the drug is not working, they're not taking the drug, or some such combination of the things. So uh, I would emphasize that, you know, once you do a trial, then you have to implement it in practice. And if, if I'm using the drug now, I'm not even using 12 and a half. I'm using 12 and a half three times a week. And since you have 6.25, like Dr. Kerr said, why don't you start lower? What's the hurry? I absolutely agree with you, sir. 6.25 once a day should be the starting dose of chlorothalidone. Thank you, Thank you Rajiv. Uh, you, yeah. Last question, uh, Franz, one second. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I let you speak, Franz. I let you speak. Uh, I know what will happen to me if I don't let you speak. I'm aware <laughs> of that. So, uh, diuretics in combination with ARNI, I would think that patients who are getting ARNI are on a, on a diuretic. I would hope so, unless they have a contraindication. 
But the other question is a good question, diuretics in combination with SGLT2 inhibitors. And that's a good question. Uh, I guess uh, uh, in terms of interaction, positive or negative, uh, I do not know, but I, I'm sure that it has to be studied and it will be studied with ARNI. I'm not worried because many patients would be on a diuretic uh, who require ARNI. Now, uh, Franz, you want to say something? Well, a very simple question to Rajiv. Um, your paper has done away with the old nephrologist hat that once GFR falls to a certain level, you stop the thiazide and you start a loop diuretic. Obviously that, I always con considered it a nonsense, but uh, you proved that it is nonsense. But the other old hat is the one of metolazone. Is that still anywhere uh, to be used? Or is it any way different? Or, I always found that again, there's no evidence, there's no good reason. What do you think about metolazone? You know, if you read the prescription of metolazone, that patient has come from a cardiologist because oh. they strongly believe that metolazone is a magic drug. They would not uh, put anybody on chlorothaladone. So we actually, when we were designing the trial, we had options, hydrochlorothiazide, entapamide, metolazone, chlorothaladone. And I chose chlorothaladone uh, because metolazone was 20 times more expensive than chlorothaladone. And metolazone comes in two flavors. There's a micronized metolazone and a regular metolazone. So I said, okay, I do a trial. I want it to be broadly applicable around the world. Now I hear the sad news that in uh, Bern in Switzerland, chlorothaladone is not available. I have to go to Germany to get it or to go to India. In Egypt, somebody wrote me an email says no chlorothaladone in Egypt. Uh, amazing, 1960 medication are not available in some countries. But I don't think that there's any special magic about metolazone. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And I, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, now uh, we are actually, uh, there are a series of uh, questions, but uh, they have been addressed in different forums already. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, um, uh, hypertension in pregnancy and drugs. Well, that's a different, uh, that's not in the context. Uh, now, conclusion-wise, this is going to be the order, and we'll really conclude. On behalf of uh, international faculty, I want uh, uh, Rajiv Agarwal to make his concluding statement on the program. On behalf of uh, our experts, uh, wonderful experts uh, from India, I want Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan to make his concluding remark, and then Dr. Ponde will make one concluding remark, and then somebody from uh, IPCA will give vote of thanks. We'll start with uh, Rajiv uh, about the program, concluding remark, one or two sentences, followed by Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan, Dr. Pandey, and the representative from IPCA. Okay, two sentences. First sentence, I'd like to thank you and the organizers for inviting me to present. And the second sentence is uh, to reflect what Dr. Kerr said start with 6.25 and uh, remember drug holiday if your patient gets sick. These are dangerous drugs, use them wisely. Dr. Narsimhan, you're yeah. muted. Uh, first, first sentence is again, uh, thanking uh, to, for giving me the opportunity, a wonderful session organized by you and uh, uh, very well conducted. Second thing is old is gold as always and uh, start slow and go. Lot, start low dose and go slow. This is the two messages which I just want to give. And uh, it's going to be a very, very important uh, drug in the management of the prevention of stroke. I'm sure it will have a unique place. Thank you. CK, CK. Yeah, I, I, I loved all the talks. I loved the uh, uh, presentations and I've learned uh, tremendously through the session today. So thanks to Dr. Mazarili, Dr. Thomas Lusher and Dr. Rajiv Agarwal. And uh, just a uh, note, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, thankfully in our cardiologist community in India, metolazone is not at all a popular drug, not at all. Because that is a drug which acts despite volume depletion. So even in a hypovolemic patient, it would act and produce uh, a lot of diuresis and you will, learn, uh, you will buy a lot of problems. So it's not at all popular in, in cardiologists in India. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Ram, for inviting me here. And thanks, Ipka. Thank you. Right. Uh, finally, and uh, finally means really, really finally. Johnny, 
or Sachin, uh, could you please uh, comment and then uh, conclude the program from your side, please? And, uh, Dr. Anil Parikh, sir. Uh, okay, I Dr. think Anil, uh, okay. I will thank all the faculty of both uh, our national and international. I think uh, all the speakers, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Masarli, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, I think it was a tremendous learning session. And then our Indian experts, Dr. Vijay Kher, Dr. C.K. Ponde, and Dr. Narsimhan. And it was really very, very enjoyable. And it was great to be in touch again with uh, uh, Dr. Messerly and Dr. Ram so, so after, after some, uh, some uh, time. And I thank all of them to, for uh, contributing. And, uh, you know, really, it was a great learning for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thanks, bye. Uh, bye -bye. All, all of you. And bye -bye. have a good bye -bye. evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you all.